King. Um, and I think most of us here as co-sponsors are trying for another a second shot um, to decriminalize walking here. And we'll get into the details about what that bill is and more, um, but essentially this is where this conversation is rooted in um, from a policy advocacy kind of legislative standpoint. We all were deeply involved in that last year and will be this year. However, there's a long history around jaywalking and racism and sexism and all of the bad parts around jaywalking laws um, that I think John um, will help us here um, illuminate a little bit more. So, and everyone needs to use the mic when we're speaking for the live stream. So here you go. All right, thank you everyone. How's everyone doing? Here's our second session, all right. Uh, just a little bit of background. My name is John Yi. I am the executive director for Los Angeles Walks. We are a pedestrian advocacy nonprofit in a city that's very car centric like LA. So uh, that's the kind of work that we do. My background is a community organizer. So before this, I did organizing with parents in poor performing schools. Before that, I was with the Lung Association doing organizing around tobacco. So really building community power, trying to you know, reach an objective is something that I really have passion about. I do even in my own community in Koreatown. I live in Los Angeles, as the name would imply. Uh, but yeah, so I'm really excited to be here to talk about this bill. It's a bill that you know, you know, really affects me personally living in Koreatown. I jaywalk all the time. So really excited to jump into this. But um, to give you a little bit of background, you know, I'm sure y'all can, maybe many of you know about jaywalking, probably have done some research, but a brief general history is that it was a term created by the auto industry um, before when the automobiles first started hitting our streets. Streets back then were pretty much complete streets. Everyone was using them, right? There was no real delineation between this is where cars are and this is where the pedestrians are. But as the automobile industry got more powerful, as more people bought cars, you started noticing the sidewalk sort of became this like segregated place for pedestrians while the rest of the street, the majority of the street was devoted to cars. And so today we are dealing with the implication of this idea of jaywalking. And it was a term, a derogatory term, I think I meant like Rube, a country bumpkin who didn't know, you know, when to cross and when not to. But the reality is we move what is best for ourselves, for our family and for our health. And so we cannot call anyone or judge someone for moving what is they know best. Uh, so that's sort of the, the issue around jaywalking. I'm sure we'll go into further more about the implications of how that law has uh, impacted us today as a society, as our city, and in the urban landscape. So that's a little bit of a background. Rio or something, member, do you want to add anything to the, the history or background around that? I have a question, if, if not. Um, I guess what was the main interest for, for you as the author and then you as your organizations to, to get involved in the bill itself? Th thanks. Well, it was, uh, it was great because um, the lawyers committee first approached me with this idea. And uh, for me, coming from a city where we are trying to encourage everybody to walk or ride their bike or to take public transit, get out of their vehicles, uh, the last thing you can imagine you'd ever want to see happen is for someone to get cited for walking. And what we discovered, um, or what, what Rio was really helpful in presenting to our, our office was that oftentimes these tickets are nuisance tickets. They're not, they're not tickets, uh, you know, in downtown San Francisco, if you're, if, you know, if you were in downtown San Francisco before COVID, there's someone jaywalking every second, right? I mean, across the street, but you don't see a significant amount of enforcement in that area, even though there's what, a lot of vehicles, there's a lot of bikes, there's a lot of buses. I mean, there, you, could, you could make an argument that perhaps it's dangerous behavior or not, but you see no enforcement. Uh, also, probably like many of you, I've, I've crossed the street, not at the crosswalk, but in the middle, never been cited until I, install, until I started working on this bill. I'd never met anybody who'd been cited for jaywalking. Um, so if you look at the stats, you know, African-Americans uh, in the cities that we were able to find stats, you know, LA, Long Beach, LA County, uh, four to five times more likely to get a citation than uh, everybody else. Beverly Hills issued a little bit over 200 jaywalking tickets, almost all of them went to African-Americans, right? And that's not considered a black neighborhood, last I checked. So, um, you know, for, for me, this was uh, two things. This is, this is about climate change, it's about encouraging people to walk, but it's also about racial justice. And so to me, it was such an interesting bill. Uh, and I really appreciate all the support uh, from this coalition, Cal Bikes, and really everybody statewide for really understanding what we were trying to accomplish. That it wasn't just a simple, bill about what people consider a minor criminal offense. As you know, while it might be a minor criminal offense, if you get a ticket, it could cost you, you know, upwards of $400 to $1,000. That's a lot of money for people who are living paycheck to paycheck or people who are working. 
Uh, and so for me, it was just, uh, you know, racial justice, economic justice, and making sure that we make our streets much more friendly for pedestrians. Thanks, assembly member, and thanks for offering the bill. Uh, and thank you all for having me. I've never been to the summit before. I'm really happy to be here. As Jared said, my name is Rio Sharp. I'm an attorney at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and when Jared and Cal Bike brought up the idea of co-sponsoring this bill last year, it was a no-brainer for us. Um, it, it, it was really clear to us why this was a civil rights issue, why it was an economic and racial justice issue. And yet I've been surprised to find that over the course of the last year, a lot of people found it curious that a civil rights organization would be co-sponsoring this bill. It doesn't always seem to people like a clear racial justice bill. Um, so I wanna just tell you how it fits into our work, which is that for the past eight or nine years, we've really had a big focus on uh, racist policing and criminal fines and fees. And a lot of this emerged from the Ferguson uprising and from the demands of organizers on the streets in Ferguson and also in other anti-racist movements since then. Two of the revelations that have really inspired our work, um, one is the urgent need to reduce low level interactions between cops and especially low income people of color. And the other is the need to reduce the financial costs of interaction with the criminal legal system. So we've done a bunch of work around these two areas, reducing interactions and reducing costs. Um, this bill really allows us to advance both of those. Um, we decriminalize everyday normal safe activity and we reduce the debt burden that people carry uh, through their lives. We, about two years ago, published a report on non-traffic infractions so all of the kind of lowest level of criminal charges, uh, but the non-driving related ones. So you think of sit lie laws that mean to criminalize people without homes or jaywalking or um, bicycle violations. So we did a report on all of these non-traffic infractions and the data was stunning, even, even for people who are already very cynical about uh, racial inequality in our society. Um, in, uh, in Long Beach, for example, where only 11% of adults are black, uh, police had given black adults 36% of all non-traffic infractions. Um, and the most common one of these was, was for jaywalking. Uh, in Bakersfield, only 6% of adults are black, but 28% of jaywalking citations went to black adults. And overall, across, across all the jurisdictions we looked at, black adults were 9.7 times more likely to receive these citations uh, these non-traffic infractions than white adults, and Latinx adults were up to 5.8 times more likely. So really, really uh, struck us how important it is to reduce the number of these non-traffic infractions. They typically are for safe activities, everyday activities, um, but they're leading to police interactions and debt burdens that have significant um, and sometimes fatal impacts on people. So another reason that we were spurred to get involved in this campaign is because there's been some recent high profile and incredibly concerning interactions between police and jaywalkers. Um, some people may have heard the story of Nandi Kane in Sacramento, who was uh, beaten to the point of concussion uh, simply for crossing the street. Um, and Kurt, Reinh Kurt Reinhold in Southern California, um, who was actually killed after being stopped for jaywalking. And the police in his case were just let off the hook a few weeks ago, the, the district attorney decided not to press any charges. So um, those are some of the most severe consequences we see from jaywalking. Um, but there's also just the incredible debt burden. The, the jaywalking fine is only $25. But when you add the fines and fees and the late charges, it's just shy of $500 for crossing the street. Um, so those, those are really the motivating forces in getting involved in this campaign. We've been fortunate to work with such strong pedestrian and, and bicycling advocates. We've gotten to learn so much about how criminalizing jaywalking really um, discourages walking and, um, and really discourages safety in a lot of ways. So I've been really fortunate to, to work with you all and get to learn so much more about um, why this is a critically important effort. I agree with everything my partner said. I would, add, I would add to that. The only thing I would add is 
The reason we support this bill is because it's a small effort to rearrange the hierarchy on our streets. Clearly, pedestrians and bicyclists, my fellow friends, I'm a pedestrian, we're on the bottom rung. But this is one small effort to reverse that and to level the playing field. If we had a bunch of cars that were like crossing a medium divide because they wanted to get somewhere faster, we would change the roads. We're still expanding highways in LA, tearing down homes to expand freeways in LA. So if we're willing to put that much money, resources, attention, political priorities in those spaces, we should be able to do the same thing with pedestrians. And so one small way of chipping at that block is allowing pedestrians to move uninhibited, unpenalized or depenalized, whatever that word is. So that's another reason, a big motivator for us to do this is we, we need to change that hierarchy on the streets and this is one way of doing it. Yeah, and, and part of that hierarchy is that not every neighborhood has the same amount of pedestrian infrastructure. So certain neighborhoods, the wealthy neighborhoods have great pedestrian infrastructure, a lot of crosswalks, a lot of signs, a lot of lights. What we found out is in the SAC B, right before the bill reached the governor's desk, they did a, a you know, four or five day story, great story about how uneven the infrastructure was, especially in the lower income neighborhoods, which is exactly where you saw a lot of policing. So again, you, you had people sort of get set up because the neighborhoods didn't have crosswalks, the neighborhoods didn't have infrastructure. So if they're just trying to get from point A to point B, walking across the street, well, it's an automatic, I mean, it's, they're basically being forced to break the law just to get from point A to point B uh, on their feet. What was also interesting is when we were talking to the governor's office and pushing back on the idea that it's not safe, because that was the big issue. Law enforcement said, oh, this is not safe, this is not safe, this is not safe. And I said, well, that's very interesting because every single pedestrian safety organization is a sponsor of the bill or supporting the bill. You know, you know, the, the very people who every day care about pedestrian fatalities and are fighting in every single one of our cities, they're all supporting it. So I don't understand that philosophy or that mindset. But what the uh, governor's office told me, and I said, well, look, most of these, most of these uh, accidents are actually caused by cars. She's like, no, according to the stats, the way they have it, the way CHP has it was two thirds, I think it's like two thirds of the accidents are caused by pedestrians. But to me, that's, that's sort of like a bias because what pedestrian jumps in front of a car, right? What, what pedestrian says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go get in front of a car today or go get in front of some moving vehicle. They, people don't do that, that's not logical. And, and so to me, it even shows bias and how that data is collected because clearly, you know, officer gets there, oh, it must be the pedestrian's fault because they, they jumped in front of the car and the only people who are supposed to be on this road is a car, right? So it goes back to John's point, not only is there a hierarchy, it's basically saying that, hey, we're not even allowed on the road unless we happen to be driving a car. Thank you. Um, I guess just since you brought up last year's campaign, I guess what lessons do you think could be learned from last year to carry on for this year's new bill? Um, I mean, I think you mentioned a little bit around Kind of rethinking the data and maybe looking at different angle of it. But is there anything you wanted to add to that? I think the only thing I would add that I'm, I'm, as I'm thinking about it now is um, we're doing this legislation around hate crimes, and there's a uh, police officer standards and training commission which is in charge of training all the peace officers up and down the state, and we're and we're setting up a policy for hate crimes so they get trained because. Some jurisdictions, shockingly, they, you know, in Riverside and San Bernardino, they've identified zero hate crimes in the county. Zero. It's not because they're not getting reported. It's, it's just because they're not getting identified, right? So we're gonna we're gonna set up the policy to create best practices. So I think in some ways, you know, we may want to consider should we have policies to train, you know, you know, the highway patrol, all the different law enforcement agencies, you know, what how to identify. You know who's who's the cause of a particular accident because to me the idea that they've always been blaming the pedestrians for the accidents just doesn't just doesn't quite make sense right uh, and so to me that that might be another policy addition because I think we need to really uh, push back against this bias and unfortunately if the data is not in our favor we have to figure out how how this data needs to get reworked or relooked at because then it really hurts our cause when we say hey all these fatalities are being caused by uh, cars. Well, action. no, no, they're all, you know, according to Highway Patrol, they're all caused by pedestrians. Do we have any, does anybody here identify as a data nerd or a, a numbers person or a stats geek? And, okay, a few people. So I'm not a numbers person. That's why I decided to go to law school. And I was very much um, impressed by how 
important, how useful, how significant the, the, the data that we were able to marshal was in this campaign. So I'll talk a bit about the data that we gathered on the racial and economic justice side. Um, and then I think it's important to speak maybe a little more in depth about the public safety data and, and sort of how we struggled with it. Um, on the racial and economic justice side, I shared some of the data with you all that we had gathered in our report a few years ago. Um, that was on non-traffic infractions more generally. We hadn't collected much specific information on jaywalking. So we were very fortunate to connect with a UC Berkeley PhD researcher, Jeff Garnand, who offered to do substantial free pro bono research for us. And he dug into the research we'd already gathered and was able to present very compelling statistics about um, how much more frequently black people are cited for jaywalking than white people, what neighborhoods jaywalking citations are being distributed in. I mean, in, in Bakersfield, it's like over 90% of jaywalking citations were in the lowest income communities. And then these citations add a couple hundred dollars of debt onto the people who get the citation. And so it's just as regressive of a policy as, as you could imagine. Um, he also created maps and visualizations for us, which helped us make our points um, even more convincingly. So we had some luck gathering data on that side, but unfortunately by the end of the campaign, it wasn't really the racial and economic justice arguments that we needed to make anymore. The, uh, our targets, mostly in the administration, they, from their vantage, they said they were convinced. They understood there were some serious equity issues, but they were so scared about the public safety implications that they weren't willing to, uh, to sign the bill. The governor wasn't willing to sign. So I think what we needed to do and what we have not yet been able to do was really marshal more convincing public safety data showing that criminalizing pedestrians, especially pedestrians of color and pedestrians in low income neighborhoods, it does nothing to save lives. Um, we haven't been able to gather that. And I wonder, Jared or John, if either of you can speak to sort of what would have been approaches we could have taken or what are approaches taken elsewhere that would have allowed us to gather stronger data to make that point. I don't have a clear answer to that, but I do know that the existing data, which, which I looked at briefly and, and I see Robert Prince in the back here from Bike East Bay who helped with this a little bit, does show um, that as simply Mayor Ting mentioned, like the governor's office was, you know, citing that it was the pedestrian's fault. Um, what they weren't looking at or what they were ignoring actually was the fact that most of the accidents causing pedestrians are the driver a vehicle's fault, the driver's fault in that case. Um, and we didn't get response to that. And I think that just kind of got neglected. Um, and in terms of Oakland in particular, um, and this is what Robert helped with early on in the campaign, um, was that uh, this Oakland PD actually de-emphasized um, stopping pedestrians. Um, and that de-emphasis actually led to a more safety or a decrease in accidents among pedestrians and cars. Um, so there is data ex that exists there. And I think, again, that was a point that was just either ignored or just you know not engaged with at all by the governor or any of the opposition on this. Um, I don't know if you have any more to add to this. So I'm a community organizer, so I deal with anecdotes, stories, very little with data, unless you know, I'm speaking with an elected official. But I mean, I understand we have to give the governor what he wants for him to sign the paper. So I totally get the politics behind it. Me personally, I mean, why do I need to prove with data that it's incredibly dangerous to walk in my community? Like, why do I need to make that effort to prove that? And again, I understand the politics of it, but I think, again, it's a bias we have with drivers. You know, when drivers are reckless, um, because the, the assumption is that pedestrians will be reckless. We will run into the street without thinking. We won't look at the light. We'll, there's all these reasons why pedestrians might make a mistake. But when cars do that, we don't nearly give as much sort of concern. We don't regulate them nearly as much as that not anywhere near as much. So for me, it's again, this bias that's baked into our political system with our elected officials about car riders in California, at least. So I think that's what I, my response would be. And as a pedestrian advocate, this is something that I remind a lot of folks, it is crash, not accident. We don't use the word accident because it implies that God it was responsible, that it could have been avoided. It can't be avoided, but all crashes as we know are, are avoidable, so. Thanks, is there anything that you, you always wanted to add regarding um lessons for, for this year? Yeah, well, one thing just that stood out from last year was the importance of having directly impacted people involved in the campaign. 
might seem obvious, but a lot of legislative campaigns lack that. They identify an important issue and then they spend the next few weeks or months searching for people who have been impacted and who are willing to speak about it. Getting cited for jaywalking can actually be a pretty embarrassing experience. Two of the folks who we worked with last year were, their, their main feeling was not anger, was not frustration, but it was mortification. They were very embarrassed. They, what they said was, we felt like we were treated as though we were criminals in front of our communities just for crossing the street. Uh, in one of their cases, uh, the police officer pulled him over blocking a drive through like a fast food lane. So all the vehicles waiting to get fast food were seeing him get cited. And it was a very embarrassing experience for him. That's just to say that um, not everybody's going to want to talk about these issues publicly. And yet finding people who are willing to can make all the difference in a campaign. We can, we can identify great experts scholars and activists to speak to the legislature, to speak to the administration, but sometimes it makes very little impact compared to having somebody who's really gone through this speak to their experience. I, I think it's something we all know intuitively, but even as somebody who understood this, it, did, it hadn't really sunk in enough for me last year. I waited too long in the year to start to really find people who were willing to speak and could speak passionately and articulately about the issue. And when we did, we got them before the legislature, we got them to the journalists, um, and they were really able to, to make a splash. I think it's part of why our campaign got fantastic media coverage last year. It really, um, though it wasn't early in the year, it wasn't talked about as broadly as a lot of other big legislative issues. By the end of the year, it had gotten as much media coverage as almost any other bill. It got huge editorials, huge articles in, in, in I think all of the, of the main publications across the state. I think part of that is because each time somebody contacted us, we were able to connect them with somebody who had a persuasive story to tell. Um, it's not enough just to know people have been affected by an issue. Uh, you have to really be able to engage them in the campaign and, and, and make sure that uh, their voice is elevated and their story is heard. So just to add, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm more of a data geek, so, so data drives a lot of my decision making. But like, if, if John's the legislator, then John's gonna to wanna to hear stories, right? So that's why we, we have to give everybody what they want. So we had the data and every time, every hearing, we always had Rio talk and then we had a uh, person who got cited for jaywalking. And, and, the, and the interesting person was, we had somebody who was up from Mendocino County who happened to be homeless. I don't, I don't even know how we found him. I, you know, but he, he would call in every single hearing and talk about you know, his story, how he got cited and basically, you know, this poor homeless guy was just cited for walking across the street to the park where he sleeps. And uh, again, you, you can, I, I don't want to make too many assumptions, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, this is nothing to do with jaywalking or safety. This is just about harassing a guy who looks a particular certain way to try to get him to move somewhere else. And that's how we hear about so many of these stories. The, the other interesting irony uh, as we got more and more press was how many reporters had gotten tickets for jaywalking. <laughs> I, I, I had a number of reporters who were covering this story like, oh yeah, I got this ticket for jaywalking for jogging in the street. And it was very, it was, so it was kind of fascinating, but I think it goes both, you know, you need both. You, you need the data and, and you definitely need it to demonstrate that this is happening to real people in your community. We're not making it up. This is something that's happening every single day. And if I could add just one small wrinkle, I mean, this is part of the law and order effort, right? Or breaking that down, sort of that perception, that sort of, not perception, it's a reality. Um, but if you talk about this issue, surprisingly, with certain communities, like we, so we work with a lot of immigrant communities. So when I talk with like, even my own parents' generation, right, Korean American immigrants, for them, when they see a law, it's a law, it's there to protect you. And so actually, when I talk to some of my elder Koreans about this law, like, why would you, and they live in Koreatown, and they navigate those dangerous streets every day, Wilshire, Western, Normandy, Vermont. And they're like, no, these, these laws are here to protect us. So I don't know why you'd want to get rid of them, because I wouldn't want to go out in a car. So there's a level of engagement, of, of education, of like sort of level setting you need to do with communities. And the same goes, we work a lot of Puramatoras. And when we presented this to our Puramatoras, they, it was a similar response. Like, this is a law here to protect us. I know my streets are dangerous. So why would I want to get rid of a law that would criminalize people being dangerous? And that's understandable, that perception. So I think it's a lot more nuanced, especially in communities of color and in immigrant communities where there's perception of law and order. 
is something that is seen as safety. And so I, it takes difficult conversations. And I think that is what is important about a law like this is that you need to have that kind of conversation. Thanks, John. Um, I forgot to mention when I was studying the context up front that, you know, California is, is trying to do this. Virginia actually did this um, in the item 2020 and was able to pass it um, along with um, ending other pretextual stops. There's a whole host of things that cops could not stop people for. Um, and I, I guess I'm thinking just, this is obviously a small issue among a broader issue around a variety of racist laws that are still on the books. I'm just thinking about other related issues that could be connected to, to jaywalking. Is there something that you all can, can add about how folks could engage with that or other things that folks might be interested in beyond just jaywalking that could be related? What other issues can you relate this to, this campaign? Um, I, I, I think um, there's a variety around fines and fees in particular that I think is kind of carrying over from last year. I think that's something that I know you both are working on at the end. I think what's interesting is we, we do know what does make our streets safer and that's lowering the speed limit. So it wasn't like, hey, we are going to, you know, get rid of the, you know, we want, we're gonna keep the jaywalking laws, but we want you to lower the speed limit. There was never that discussion, right? So I think it is very much going back to, you know, fighting what people's bias is based on absolutely no information at all and actually presenting them with, this is what actually works and kind of pushing back on that. So I think that that's a, a real narrative in terms of really fighting back and ensuring, you know, this is what, it goes back to, you know, all the safe streets discussions, like what do safe streets look like? I think this is one piece of that, but it's just constantly reminding, you know, people in policy, de policy decision-making capacities, what safe streets look like. So I think having what that rubric looks like and constantly reminding people, this is what a safe, you know, safe community looks like and all these different pieces. So this is just one piece of that, but there's all these other pieces. So it's interesting. Yeah, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna attack somebody for crossing the street, but you're not attacking and saying, hey, we have an epidemic of cars speeding down our streets, right? It's for, but that's but somehow, it's, it's a, this, this, this one problem, uh, you know, can't be, can't be addressed, but there's other problems here. Brio, I wonder if you can speak more to just the criminal justice reforms that I know you're working on separately from this. Um, I started by talking about, you know, the reduction of fines and fees and decriminalization. Um, and I'd say there's other related efforts in both of those buckets that connect to the jaywalking work we're doing and that I would encourage you all to look into or get involved in. So on the fines and fees piece, I mentioned how a jaywalking fine is $25, but all fines and fees included, it can be up to $500. Well, a huge portion of that debt burden is this $300 hidden late fee that exists in California. It's mostly used in traffic courts. Um, but it's imposed on both drivers and non-drivers in traffic courts. Even for something like jaywalking, a $25 fine, if you miss your payment deadline, often because you can't afford to pay, you're hit with a $300 late fee. Um, these, as you could imagine, mostly affect people who don't have the money to pay or can't make it to court by the due date because of work schedules, childcare schedules, et cetera. So, um, our organization, along with the Debt Free Justice California Coalition, we've been waging a two-year effort to eliminate entirely these $300 late fees. They're extracting about $100 million a year from California communities. It's an incredibly backwards way to try to raise money to fund the courts. We should be, as a state, we should be funding our courts. Uh, as a society, not on the backs of people least able to afford it. So um, those fees are called the civil assessments. We've been pushing really hard to get them eliminated. The legislature has been fully supportive. Um, but again, we've run into an obstacle with the administration. Uh, Governor Newsom wants to reduce the civil assessment from $300 down to $150. Um, Still, $150 is, is, is wildly unaffordable for so many of us um, and makes a little difference 
uh, to somebody who really has no money to pay. So in the next two months, we're going to be fighting hard to get the administration on board to support full elimination of these late fees and relief of all the debt that's already been imposed by these late fees. Um, so that's our big effort on the fines and fees side. On the decriminalization side, there's some exciting efforts. Um, one of them is in San Francisco. There's a whole effort to end pretext policing. So there's a coalition that's working to identify, you know, what are all the low level citations that we really want the police to deprioritize or um, be prevented from enforcing unless there's some other broader uh, violation going on. So that's the Stop the Pretext campaign in San Francisco. Um, and then statewide, eventually we want to see the legislature um, create an opportunity for local jurisdictions to remove police from traffic enforcement. There have been some efforts in different cities to remove police from traffic enforcement. Um, yeah. But there are state legislative barriers to doing so. So it's going to require sort of collaboration between advocates, between local electeds, and between the state legislature to create an opening where states can start to experiment with other ways to do traffic enforcement that don't have the same consequences that, um, that police interactions and criminalization have. So um, that's what I'd suggest in terms of what we see as connected efforts to get involved in. Yeah, it's actually really fascinating to hear what's happening on the state level. So I guess my reaction response to that on the local level is, is that I see echoes of this issue jaywalking in so many other issues. And the most the common denominator that sort of exists through it all is who is a good actor on the sidewalk space versus who is a bad actor on the sidewalk space. And the government is trying to make a distinction between one and the other. So I'll give you a few examples. Street vending in LA was a years long battle trying to get street vendors the right to sell and vend on the streets. And so right now there's moves in city council to limit street vendors because of ADA access. And this is a city that's completely messed up all of its sidewalks. So it's kind of ridiculous that talking about ADA access. But they're leveraging that to say, you're a good street vendor, you're a bad street vendor, right? Same with, uh, with the houses crisis going on in LA. I'm sure a lot of y'all experienced the same thing. When there was an Echo Park, there was going to be, there was a sweep that happened. Uh, one of the city council members, Mr. O'Farrell, did a sweep of the, of the park there. And he brought in tons of military, like, style police to go in and push the homeless out. And what was the, the rationale out behind it, at least from his office? Pedestrian access, about who is allowed to be, who should be allowed to walk on the space and who shouldn't be allowed. So there's echoes of this in so many areas about who is a good pedestrian versus who is a bad pedestrian. But on the other hand, when the pandemic happened, we were like this when it came to private businesses doing, you know, opening up the sidewalk space for dining. Right? We were like this when it came to wealthy, privileged communities doing open streets in their community so they can walk and bike and be comfortable. So it, it's a complete dichotomy in which we treat certain communities as bad pedestrians and certain communities as good pedestrians. I kind of want to open it up to audience q and I, I, I know these folks pretty well for the last couple of years and heard a lot, and I, I hope you all have, have questions. Is, is that okay? Is there anything you all wanted to add before I, I go there? Okay. And I'll, I can walk around here with your mic and I'll just go around. There's a lot of hands. So <laughs> let's go here with first with Megan. Um, so I have a super egregious example of victim blaming um, that happened about 10 years ago. Um, Culver City PD was doing a safety training. Uh, we're one of the few cities that has red light cameras and a woman this was in a school, uh, a woman ran a red light and hit a pedestrian. Thankfully he lived. Um, but what ended up happening was that the pedestrian, even though it was on camera that this woman ran the red light, some of the blame was assigned to the pedestrian who was the victim because two things, he didn't look they said that the law said that the, it is the pedestrian's responsibility to look before crossing. Therefore, he got some of the blame and he was wearing a hoodie and he got some of the blame for that. So that to me is, if that is still on the books, like to me, that it feels like that fundamentally and quickly needs to be changed. And I think the other thing, because I was a, a mayor and city council member, and I was in this closed session meetings where you know the city gets sued when there's a, a, a crash or something, and the city is always like it's in the best interest of the city, you know, to not get sued, but not by solving the problem, 
and and I feel like there's this constant frustration, even with um, elected officials who want to make these fundamental changes, because like the MUTCD and all that, the, all those documents say that oh, you make it safer by closing down this sidewalk, right, or or by by closing this pedestrian thing so that you you know only so the left turn accidents don't have, we get <laughs> grants from the federal government for safety when we close down pedestrian access points. And so like, it feels perverse, it is perverse and it is racist. And it's, and it feels like even on a local level, it is so hard to do the right thing when the system is poison. Questions. Let, let me just say one one thing, to, not, not not to address the specific issue, but th th this is all why it's so important to have you know Cal bikes, Cal walks, all your different organizations all around the state, because uh, when you go through transportation committee, I mean part of the challenge is, is the state governs all the transportation code, right? It's so all the transportation laws, it's all the road laws. And if you go through each of the Senate transportation or Assembly transportation there is just an inherent bias for whatever CHP says goes. So, oh, CHP is the, you know, they're the arbiter about whether someone's safe walking or whether someone's safe biking. And I think that's why it's so important for all your organizations to kind of organize, bring up that voice because, you know, C CHP is always sort of like, you know, gonna argue for the status quo. They're, they're never really arguing for change. They think this is, this is the way things are, are the way things that are fine. So I think you, know, you all being in Sacramento, having a larger voice in Sacramento, but also having a larger voice at home is really starting to make a difference. You have a lot of us legislators who come from communities where we've organized, become very familiar with all these variety of issues. When we get to Sacramento, we're ready to champion these issues, but we need your continued help up there because it just always defaults to whatever CHP thinks they, they goes, whether they know what they're talking about or not. Great, more questions. Hi, uh, and thank, thank you all for the work you've been doing on this. Uh, really, really inspiring and, and super important. So I appreciate you all being here and talking about it. Uh, I've begun collecting data in San Diego on um, all the bike related offenses that people are stopped for and um, who stopped and where. Uh, and I think ideally all of these pretextual offenses would be changed on the state level, but that's, that's kind of a pretty long process and kind of as a, as a local nonprofit, um, can't drive that effort. So, um, my question is what kind of decriminalization efforts can we ask for locally that aren't going to put us in conflict with state law? question and thanks for the work you're doing. Also, um, there is a lot that can be done on the local level. There are municipal ordinances related to jaywalking and biking that can be changed. Um, and there are also police priorities that can be changed. So Jared mentioned Oakland's effort to de-emphasize pedestrian and bicycling violations. That's something that should definitely be looked at, at least from what we saw. It looked pretty successful in terms of reducing the number of those violations and also uh, seeing fatalities and serious injuries go down. Um, and then also look to the San Francisco campaign, the Stop the Pretext campaign, because it may be that the best option is to, is to lead or participate in the campaign to change the, the police's priorities or to reduce their authority to cite for those kinds of um, violations, except under limited circumstances. Maybe just to add to that, uh, you're in San Diego, right? Um, just finding out who's doing the work like right now. I, I know ACLU and other smaller organizations are, are like after the 2020 protests, you know, got really organized to, to push city council. So I, I definitely can, we can connect later, but definitely find those local orgs who are already doing it and connect. More questions. I'm trying to make a diverse selection here. So I know Yolanda, here we go, Yolanda. Thank you uh, for the information that you shared. I guess my first question is um, with the data. Do you have the data uh, that you've shared in one central place that we can have access um, to that? Or is that something that's possible so that we can um, consistently share um, solid information, you know, with all the work that we're doing? That's question one. And then um, two is as much as I am for defund 
the police. Um, I live in a community where we have just created bike lanes, uh, first time ever, um, in a red line community that I grew up in that I never had the opportunity to ride a bike and would have to put my bike in the car and go to the beach or some other location um, that's safe. Uh, so now we have bike lanes in a still predominantly but very fast changing um, demographic uh, of brown and black people. Um, and our, our street lanes have been reduced. It's been reconfigured through LA DOT, uh, two lanes going um, west and east. And uh, basically now it's dropped down to one lane on both sides and we've added a bike lane. Um, this was done because Adams Boulevard was a high injury network. Lives were being taken, hit and run. And those lives were mainly black and brown lives. Um, cars are misusing the bike lane. They are still, they're resisting this change. So basically, what do we do? You know, I, I, my question is from a standpoint of citations and the historical um, activities that have taken place, how do we slow cars down still? Because more lives will be taken. And in most cases, those will be black and brown lives. And I don't know who the motorists are. I'm not doing that surveying. They could be black and brown people for all I know. They can be white people, I don't know. But the bottom line is um, the community's complaining, um, where's the LAPD? Because this is dangerous and someone's going to be killed. So we are, um, it's, there's a lot happening, you know, in this conversation, but I just wanted to get your recommendation on, um, how do you see us going forward? What are your recommendations? So just to the first question, and then I'll defer to others to talk about street design and infrastructure question. Uh, in terms of the data, we have not made it as easily available as we should have. And so I appreciate the question. And I'm looking at Jared and I'm gonna commit that we're gonna to try to add some of our most recent data to the website that's been sort of a centerpiece of the campaign that's maintained through CalBike. We're gonna make an effort to do that so that the, um, so that the freedom to walk website uh, has the most relevant and recent information available. So thank you for encouraging that. And then I wanna invite, wanna invite either of you all to talk to the second issue. So what, one of my first bills with Cal Bikes when I got to the legislature was around protected bike lanes. And so obviously you could work with planning to make sure that the, that the bike lane is actually protected. Uh, you could also limit access by, you know, as, you know, by putting pylons or something as people can enter. So it's really only a bicycle could enter versus a vehicle. Uh, it's, I think there, there are a number of different ways you could design it. I really, I understand the first thing is to work to um, go get law enforcement to start writing a bunch of citations, but I don't know that that's really the ultimate solution. You, you really want to make it so that that lane uh, is easily accessible for the bicyclists, but maybe not easily accessible for, for cars. Mystery crosswalks, speed humps, flat sidewalks, more regular bus intervals so people don't have to run and jaywalk to catch their bus, uh, bus shelters, better lighting, better shade. I mean, these are all tons of stuff that can make reduce uh, jaywalking. So let's, let's work together. <laughs> all right, next question. Yeah, so um, I just had a quick question about um, some of the systemic racist issues that we have even with um, getting pedestrian and bike infrastructure implemented. And this is more of a question for John as well too, uh, uh, specifically for John, it's a little cheating because I've worked with John before, but um, can you discuss the work that you've done with the promotoras and the, uh, the issues that they've had with getting simple life-saving infrastructure like crosswalks installed and the issues that they've faced while trying to work with the um, like local, uh, like city council or local like DOT and stuff like that as well too. Yeah, one speed hump in LA takes you over a year to secure. And if you don't speak English, if you don't know how to work a PDF, if you don't know how to work a Google form, you're pretty much screwed. You're left out entirely of government services. And the only recourse you have is to beg your city council member to do what you want. And at that point, it becomes a political game. It doesn't become about a city service, it's about who is louder in that political office. So the whole system is entirely messed up. And so I think we need to reform how we dole out you know, city resources when it comes to pedestrian infrastructure. So yeah, I can go on about, about the systems issue about what we face as community organizers. Yeah, 
Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's been it's been really great to hear from you all. Um, so my question is, jaywalking is kind of a term coined by the auto industry in the 1920s. So kind of wanting to know, are you still having pushback from the auto industry or is it solely now from CHP where you're seeing these concerns of safety? <laughs> At least in regards to who's had influence in the capital, I'd say it's primarily law enforcement and primarily CHP. And I think what we did was we were able to work out an amendment that still got our bill what we needed, uh, but wasn't as ideal as striking the law, but it was able, it was enough to get CHP to a neutral position. But, uh, but, the, but it just demonstrates how they have an outsized influence, because again, it's not CHP in every single one of our communities policing the roads, right? So it's kind of interesting. They're, they're the ones providing the advice, but they're not in LA. I mean, outside of the freeways, right? They're not in, they're not in, they're not on Adams. Uh, you know, they're not on Wilshire. They're not on any of the streets. They're not in, you know, on Market Street in my, in my community. So again, it, it just demonstrates it. It's why our voices need to be louder. And that's just going to take time. It's going to take, it's going to take John to organize. It's going to take all of you as organizers. That's why you're all here. And your voices are definitely growing. I remember I, I, had to, I sat down with uh, Dave Snyder um, you know, in 2012 when I was running for the legislature and you know, Cal Bike was just kind of getting started. And I said, look, you know, when I get to Sacramento, I, I want to be your bike, you know, I want to be your bike legislator, right? I, I, I want to be championing all these issues because I think they're so important. And uh, you know, I get to do that coming from San Francisco because my constituents get it. I, I don't, you know, if I was coming from Fresno, I couldn't necessarily do that. But just being able to, you know, myself grow and watch Cal Bikes grow, it's just been huge. And so that voice is getting bigger and bigger, but it still needs to grow. We still got a long way to go, but there's been huge progress in the last 10 years. It's a good question. I, um, I know the insurance industry is, is pretty active in Sacramento, but they didn't come down with the position, did they, on, on this at all? So no, Not to my knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you uh, for the work that you're doing uh, to decriminalize um, walking. As you know, I'm sure everyone knows that the Black community has been over-policed for the last 400 years. And so I'm glad that there's some conversation and some concrete work being, do being done. Um, I'd also like to talk, I'm an Oakland native, but there's a city, a neighboring city to Oakland um, that actually penalizes Black youth, preteens and teenagers for riding their bicycles into their city. They take the bicycles from children and tell them don't come back to our city. So it's so much larger than just walking. It's, it's, it's everything. It's, you know, you're in your black skin, you're in your brown skin, and you literally cannot go into the next city. That city needs Oakland to get to San Francisco. So I mean, come on, all your residents are coming through our city, but we are forbidden from going to your city without being penalized. So I don't know if you've run into any of that or any efforts are being done to address that situation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I haven't run into that exact situation, but I will echo what you said that this is, I mean, we see it as essentially low hanging fruit. Like we, it's possible, it's feasible for us to decriminalize jaywalking, but there are so many other everyday activities that people are punished for, criminalized for, made to feel marginalized for. and that's really the broader effort is how do we extricate police and policing from many, many, many more aspects of our lives. Um, because for the black community and for many other communities in our country, um, policing, especially low level policing is just a continued form of harassment and sort of social control. Um, even just decriminalizing jaywalking is really difficult, even though there's broad widespread agreement that it's a ridiculous, <laughs> Uh, criminal violation. So if we want to do more, if we want to decriminalize more broadly, we need a much stronger movement. Um, we faced a governor's veto just to decriminalize jaywalking. So doing other low level citations that are more controversial, I don't know that we have the collective power for yet. And it's that kind of collective power building, the, the bridges that we're building between the civil rights community, the pedestrian community, the bicycling community, it's that kind of bridge building. Um, but also a, a great deal more power building that we're gonna need to do because we, we felt how limited our leverage was last year. Even with 90 organizations signed on, active organizations like the ones in this room, we still couldn't get the bill over the, over the finish line. 
Um, and that was a, a relatively uncontroversial bill. So in terms of the broader work we wanna do to make life less full of harassment and policing for youth, for people of color in the Bay Area, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of movement building and we're here to do it, but we're all gonna need to do it. That's right, yeah. And they're involved in the coalition. We can absolutely do better. In fact, with other campaigns we're a part of, we've had more success partnering with black and brown led coalitions and movements. Um, we haven't as effectively shown how this campaign is critically important to advancing racial and economic justice as, as we could. Um, but certainly that's, that's core to our strategy and, and, and essential. Hey, Kathy, you talking about Beverly Hills? I mean, an assembly member just brought up, he brought up an actor, which is Beverly Hills. And they did, someone had to sue the city. And they, I think almost 99% were black men that were ticketed. And do you know what that sort of project was called? It was called the Safe Street Project. There was something, but the, the word Safe Street was in it. Do you have any programs Los Angeles Walks has that's called Safe Streets, right? Safe Street Promotora Program, Safe Streets Wilmington. We use that term as well. And so it's being co-opted. And so again, it's a perception of who deserves to be there, who doesn't deserve to be there. And so when you see the word safe streets, always ask yourself, what do they really mean by that? Safe for whom? So can I? But, but, but I will add just to give us a little bit of hope. So no, normally when the governor's office vetoes a bill, they say, oh yeah, yeah, hey, we're gonna get together. We're gonna work on it. We're gonna work on it for next year. But I think we had done such a good job. All the advocates have done, all of you had done such a great job. We had you know, editorial, I mean, all the newspapers editorialized, this is stupid, we, we should get rid of these laws. Um, they literally called us the next week. And it's, and it's the first time that I can remember after a veto that we actually had a solution ready to go in January. I mean, they really did spend you know, the fall really working out a solution. I think, I think because they realized, one, they were wrong. Two, they realized, you know, they, they couldn't really defend this, that we were, we, you know, we had provided all the information, all the data, everything was moving, you know, our way. There, there was no real uh, justification. So it just demonstrates, again, all your work is, is moving the needle. There's no question. Before the next question, can I just add a little bit to the last question, what Rio was already saying? I think, I think the bigger movement is part the big picture of this. And I think it wasn't an accident that the George Floyd killing and the protests that were after that, this bill got a lot of traction, you know, just brought everything to the table. And I think to the second part around the 400 plus years that you mentioned, I think as Rio mentioned, this is kind of like low hanging fruit jaywalking, but I, I think whether it's the law enforcement, like that is touching on that 400 plus years of history. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot bigger than that, but you know, in some ways it's a little smaller. I saw a question. Hi, I'm a recipient of a jaywalking ticket. I, I, <laughs> I got it back. All my life, I was walk, I was taught to walk between the lines from growing up. And the very first time, 1985, out here, I was walking across the street going to work. And the very first time that I jaywalked, I got a jaywalking ticket. I was going to BART and I parked my car and I walked across, I was like walking and I was like, oh, I'm not gonna make this light. And so I walked up and boom, I shot across the street and there was an officer right there to give me a ticket. And um, I went home that night and I told my parents what happened and they said, that's what you get. I'm also a travel trainer for United Seniors of Oakland, Alameda County. And when I travel train seniors who are um, transitioning from taking their uh, cars, um, dr from driving their cars to taking public transit and walking, I teach them to walk in between the lines. A senior went back to work and she works, she worked down here somewhere. And the very first time, six months I worked with her or a little less, um, learning how to get back and forth, taking the bus routes, working with discontinued services and different things like that, that we have to deal with in our neighborhoods. Um, the very first time that uh, she went out to lunch with her um, comrades, she got hit by a car. They were all jaywalking. So, I mean, I'm just saying, what's wrong between, what, what, what's so wrong with walking between the lines? Can, you know? 
Can we there, put it there's, there? there? There's nothing wrong with walking between the lines. I, I don't think we're saying uh, you shouldn't walk walk between the lines. Uh, but if you look at the data, the Chronicle did an article uh, a couple months ago. So I mentioned the SACB article last year. Not every community. Down, downtown has it because, again, a lot of people, a lot of um, uh, pedestrians, a lot of public transit, but not every community even has those lines. And again, you have some people in um, you know, more uh, neighborhoods which have a little more crime. Literally, I have stories of my colleagues. These are just my colleagues. I'm not even talking about you know, regular folks. These are just fellow legislators. They said, you know, I would jaywalk because if I got to the crosswalk and I walked there, you know, there were dangerous people over there. So then this is just them walking to school. I'm not talking about you know, today, but you have, uh, what you have is if every neighborhood had good crosswalks, good pedestrian safety, absolutely, right? You know, we want, we, want, we want that pedestrian infrastructure. So that's something that we all talk about. We want that infrastructure. We're not saying no, but given that you don't, we don't think that people should be criminalized for walking in their own community, walking in their own neighborhood, just walking to the bus stop, walking to work. You know, again, we absolutely, I, I always wanna encourage, look, safe pedestrian behavior. But again, the way we did the bill was you could still get cited if you're not safe. And that was always the case. Like you could, even when we got rid of the laws last time, if you're not being safe, you could still get cited. Now, the, que the question is, is when, you know, when you cross the street, were you, were you running yourself at risk or was it just, hey, the officer just had an easy citation? And I think, Right, that's right. Agreed. Agreed. No, agreed. Right, and 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 I think the question is is were they were they citing as many pedestrians as they were automobiles, right? We all know what DUI stops look like. So when they take us seriously, get these DUI stops. So were they doing what they needed to do to slow down? Uh, police. I, I work at San Francisco City Hall. We had a pedestrian crossing the crosswalk um, in the middle of the crosswalk, got hit, right? right, Just right, literally right in front of City Hall, one of our officials. And, and now there's a stoplight because of that. But, but, it beget, but again, it, you know, it's because it was in front of City Hall, right? And so that doesn't happen in every single community. So I think, yes, we know there are dangerous intersections. We want to make it safer, but we don't think, at least I don't think, I'm not going to say we, I don't think, that you should only be citing one group of people. If, if you are trying to make that whole area safer, you're reducing speeds for the vehicles, you're making sure that the vehicles are also being watched as well as the pedestrians or the cyclists, hey, that, that, that's okay. But I think the concern is that only one group of people is ever being cited, not the other. I love this conversation because I feel like we need to have more conversations like this because I feel like your perspective on this actually is a lot of people. And what I would say is sometimes it is safer to jaywalk. Sometimes it's not sometimes, but many times it's more dignified to jaywalk. Many times it is more convenient to jaywalk. And so those circumstances do exist. Um, and so, yeah. One last question and I see other hands, just find me after and like I'll talk your ear off about this if you still have questions. And I'll make RB here at the last one. I think. Yeah, um, so I mean, I, I live in the sideshow capital of the world. I don't know if y'all know about sideshows, um, but the, the car culture in Oakland rules the, the road as, as well as the law. Um, and so one thing I learned as an advocate, thanks to Robert here, um, is that laws is enforced only on education. Um, so we, we had an incident like she was talking about with the youth. I work with the youth. And so when we ride uh, south of East Oakland and San Leandro, officers were like pulling up in their cars, opening their car doors, trying to door the youth cyclists um, because they, they didn't understand the style of riding that the kids was doing as well as like OPD. Like I got probably over like 50 tickets from just riding my bike in East Oakland, like taking a ticket for the team. Um, but it was more the education concept. Like the officers didn't understand that three feet is the law. 
Um, they didn't understand that uh, pedestrians had a right away, um, especially with people in big metal boxes like pedestrians should always have a right away, whether they're in a crosswalk or jaywalking, um, as well as uh, cyclists riding on the sidewalk. Um, so as a father, I got a, a, a six-year-old kid that California law say he can't ride in the street and he has to ride on the sidewalk. But if I ride on the sidewalk, it's a $590 ticket. Um, so I, I'm just curious to like, I mean, the data is cool, but I, I think the education behind it, like for law enforcement and the public is, um, is key. I would just respond, this law isn't going to save us. We can't just push for this law. This has to come with infrastructure change. This has to come with public education, you know, driving safer. So it's a constellation of issues. And I think this is just one of those stars that we're trying to, trying to get to. Thank you. That was a great last word. And thank you, panelists, for this session. Appreciate it, everyone.